Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school, and that is what this podcast is designed to do, to educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jade Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only, to learn, to teach, and to love. Love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. I'm grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. Level. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. Today, I'm with two of my best friends in the world. They've come down to visit me in my hometown of Asheville, and we've been masterminding, and we decided to put a podcast together. And this is a podcast for three people who have been coaching for a very long time, uh, combined years. It's probably, what, over 50 years? I don't know. Ray and I have been doing it a long time. Danny's been doing it a long time. Um, the, the topic is really what makes a great coach. So uh, rules of great coaches. So for those of you who are professionals, uh, for those of you who are looking to get into the coaching industry, and I would even say for those of you who aren't coaches and are just good friends to family and peers and coworkers, someone who other people come to for advice, you're acting as a coach as well. And so you're going to get uh, something from this as well. And so what we're going to do is we're kind of going to do this in a little bit of a round robin. And um, I'm going to start with you, Danny, and we're going to talk about what uh, our roles are for coaching. And we can kind of start anywhere and that will just kind of get us a a discussion. So Danny's going to discuss, you know, one of his top roles and we'll go to Ray, we'll go to me and uh, you may find us commenting on that, but hopefully you'll enjoy uh, the discussion today. So why don't you get us kicked off, Danny? What, what from your perspective is makes a great coach? What are one of the, your top roles that you like to teach? Yeah. So this is, well, first I'll set, I would like to say just something like when we were preparing this pod and all weekend, one of the reasons I thought this would be a good idea is because we've been talking about coaching and our approaches to it, our experiences with it all weekend. And a lot of times we kind of disagree or maybe just perceive it through a different lens. And I thought this could kind of be cool for us to list our top rules of coaching each, and then we can kind of open the floor and maybe disagree with each other a little bit. I think that that would be good for the audience to see kind of where they land as well. So my first rule, if I'm kicking this thing off, I made a list here just in case you guys stole one of mine, but my number one overall, and I've been advocating this uh, to my people a lot lately, is I, I guess I'll just call it, you have to have the ability to connect, basically social skills. I think this is of the utmost uh, importance. My experience directing a team of coaches, this is interesting. I don't even know if you know this, Jade. Jade and I built this program together. We hired these coaches together, and I oversaw the coaching team. And one of the things that really stuck out to me was that the top coach we had by far in every category, the data showed this from uh, retention to going on to the next level and re-upping their package to uh, customer satisfaction to actual client results was also probably the least knowledgeable about metabolism, about hormones, about really health and fitness at all. It was a woman who was in her fifties and coaching and training was a career she picked up after retiring from a uh, lifetime in sales. So she really didn't have all this background or experience. We liked her a lot. We hired her and she just blew it out of the water. And the difference was when I was paying attention to her stuff, she just knew how to connect with people. She would remember their kids' names. She would remember, oh, how was vacation at this particular spot? She would ask them follow-up. Did you get that resolved at your job? How did that end up happening? She just remembered things about their life. So they felt safe. They opened up to her. They shared things with her that they may have not shared with another coach. So to me, connection is my number one rule of great coaching. It goes to that old, old quote, it doesn't matter 
People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So paying attention to the human element of your clients is the utmost importance uh, from my perspective. So my first rule is the ability to connect or have social skills. Yeah. And isn't it funny, Ray, that, that uh, Danny would choose that at his first because he's a master. Anyone who knows Danny, if you know you all knew Danny, you would be like, he's the one who connects the easiest um, to people. So it is actually something that you're uh, just incredible at. Ray, how about you, man? What's your your top rule? Coaching is a, a, a unique profession in that it's one of the few professions where somebody can go and have a conversation with somebody else that is entirely one-sided. Like where was the last time where you didn't feel like you need to reciprocate in a conversation? You know, if, you, if I were to compliment you, you'd feel obligated to compliment me back. And, and with coaching, that is um, – I feel like that's that's one of the superpowers of coaching is you've got somebody here who's asking you questions, who's here entirely for you. And and if it's a great coach, one of the things that great coaches do is they're able to separate the drama of their own life and their own biases towards what's right and what's wrong to open it up, open up that space. You know, they say, you know, hold that space for the other client who is sitting in front of them. And I feel like that's that's something that the best coaches really master. Like when you sit down with one of these coaches where uh, that, that is just a, an elite coach and, and to a great extent, we get that with you is when you're talking to you, we uh, we feel like, you know, you're the only we're the only people in the room. And I think that's why, you know, you and Danny are such successful coaches is because the you have that ability to set your own stuff aside and and really connect with the person in a way. And, and I guess this comes down to what you were talking about, Danny, as well, is part of that connection is in saying, I'm here for you entirely. Like in this time together, this is about you. This is about your desires. This is about what's going on in your life. And a good coach is able to kind of pull their their own stuff out and set it aside for that time. And, you know, the, 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 the really world-class coaches know how to do that to a really high level. Yeah. It's interesting, right? We talk, we, you, the three of us oftentimes talk about charisma, right? So power, presence, warmth. And it seems like that connection piece is the, a presence factor. It's the ability to be present and to be present means you're there 1000% for them. I love that. Um, I would say my, my top rule goes right along with the two of you. And I would call it the rule of humanity. And I think this is just a rule of uh, that every good friend should have. And it basically is this idea that to let people know that they're only human. When someone comes uh, with a problem, there's often shame around it. There's embarrassment around it. There's this idea that I'm no good. I'm a failure. There's a lot of self-worth wrapped up in what people are going through. And one of the first things that I think we humans need to do is to recognize that we all suffer. None of us are without our missteps and mishaps and mistakes. And to essentially just let people know, look, you're only human. Humans mess up. Humans have mistakes. You are valuable in that. You're no different, no worse than anyone else. And I think the law of humanity is something that a lot of our friends, now a lot of coaches uh, forget this piece. And it's a very simple way to do the law of humanity. It is just to say, hey, you know, you're only human, right? It's just to simply call that out. We forget to do that as friends. What that does to me is that's the opening gambit of a good coach to essentially help someone understand that, hey, they're only normal, humans mess up, um, and uh, it's okay to just be human. And the other thing that does is it basically says, you're safe here. You're safe with me. I get it. Uh, let's begin to have a conversation that goes into uh, I'll open it up with my second rule. Then we'll go back to Danny, which is the rule of empathy, because these are so uh, related. And the rule of empathy is slightly uh, different from my perspective than the rule of humanity, because the rule of humanity says, hey, you're only human. And the rule of empathy goes, God, I just can't imagine you're doing such a good job. That's like that's so hard. And to me, that's the opening gambit of a good coach, just to let someone know I heard you. You're only human. That must be so difficult. 
And to me, it's like, um, I feel like when a, someone goes into a room and is going to get coached, they're almost holding their breath a little bit, what this is going to be like, especially if, they're, if it's their first coaching session. And uh, I think these two rules, my first two rules, the humanity and the law of empathy, essentially let someone exhale. And I think it goes right along with the, what you two said. I definitely think though those two kind of complement each other. It's that old Carl Rogers quote, the great, the GOAT psychologist from my perspective. Carl Rogers, he says, of uh, of course, the great paradox is that I cannot change until I feel accepted for who I am. So it's kind of that's like the, you're the baselines. Like first you got to be like, dude, it's okay. You're human. Maybe you made some mistakes. Maybe there were some bad choices along the way, but you're still worthy human being. Like it's, it's okay. And that is a good foundational place uh, for, for growth and change. It's actually, I think it's essential. So I love that you brought that. Up. I had that on my list as well. My second rule and I'll be interested to see what you think. Well, let me just uh, comment on that because I, I have a similar, you know, that's that's something that I do tell clients when they vocalize that they messed up. You know, perhaps they said they were going to do something for the week. They come back into the session and they didn't get it done. And um, and maybe they did something or maybe they did something that goes against, almost counter to their goals that they set for themselves. And one thing I'll tell them, I'll say, look, there's only one reason we humans do anything. And that is because it seemed like a good idea at the time. And when you think of it like that, then you start to look for the, um, the good intention behind everything that you do. You know, even the, even the stuff that you hate about yourself, even the things that you label as bad in your life or, you know, why did I, why did I smoke then? Well, you know, I said, I'm not going to smoke. I said, I'm going to quit smoking. Well, you know, what do you do when you smoke? Well, I talk to my friends. Well, the good intention there is that's connection for you. And, and that's, at the, that's at the heart of it. Okay, so when you can accept that, hey, there is a good intention for me smoking. Now we, keep, we have something we can work with. But when we ignore that, when we fight it, you know, when we resist it, then we can't, we can't deal with it, right? We'll be back after a quick break. Okay, let's take a brief break. I want to tell you about a product, a product that I was heavily involved in that is now available for you. And this is metabolic super protein. Up until this point, people who bought my programs, metabolic renewal, metabolic aftershock, metabolic prime, they were the only individuals who can get metabolic super protein, the protein that we designed when I was with metabolic Dot com. Now, I'm no longer with Metabolic.com. However, this is the best protein, in my opinion, on the market. And so despite the fact that I'm no longer with Metabolic.com, I still think this is the best protein for you to use. It's the best tasting. It's a mix of collagen and whey protein. It is very easy on the gut. We did everything when I was at Metabolic to make this the best protein available on the market. And Metabolic Super Protein is now available for all of you. And I still have a special deal for you based on my uh, involvement with Metabolic.com in the past. And so you can get a special deal on your first try of Metabolic Super Protein. This is the protein I use every day. I actually use it in my coffee, make a nice coffee protein latte. I've been doing that for the last several months and I'm absolutely loving it, but I also add it to a lot of other things, including taking it whenever I am having cravings. I especially like to use it at the end of the day when I've had my dinner and I'm needing a taste of something else and I just want to shut off those cravings and that hunger that are the thing that keeps me from getting results because I can be a big eater at night if I'm not careful. Metabolic super protein is the protein that you want to use. If there was one thing that I could tell you to do diet wise to help you lose fat, maintain muscle and regain your health and optimize your metabolism, it would be increasing your protein intake. It is the best thing that you can do. Definitely try metabolic super protein. You will not be disappointed. I promise you. To get Metabolic Super Protein, go to drjade.com slash protein deal. drjade.com slash protein deal. And you will get a deal on Metabolic Super Protein 
and you can try it. I am convinced this is going to be your best and most favorite protein you have ever tried. DRJ.com slash protein deal. And let's get back to the show. Totally. Yeah. I, I had nothing else to add to that concept. I think that's, that's really good uh, as well, Ray. I think my second rule would be, we'll call it the rule of dialogue. So one of the things that I noticed with coaches is kind of funny, actually, just more often than not, coaches are really nervous. Like, what if I say the wrong thing or what, what if I don't have the right, right words or whatever? Uh, more often than not, something really obvious happens in a coaching call. Maybe a client opens up and it's, a, it's like a really good breakthrough and there's an opportunity to have a conversation or maybe uh, they're just, it could be anything. Maybe they're just perpetually late or maybe you offer a suggestion. I've seen this on a lot of coaching calls. Coaches will give like, all right, here's what I think we should do. Tell me what you think. And a client will visibly roll their eyes or visibly like sigh and, and like slouch in their chair on, on these Zoom calls. And I remember watching these videos and the coach would just kind of continue on because it's uncomfortable. So like, okay, I guess let's talk about the next thing, right? So they scooch it on. So I say the rule of dialogue is really about what I always say is give it oxygen. So if you notice something, do it in a non-judgmental, curious way. But if you notice an eye roll, just, just have that discussion. Like, hey, I noticed you rolled your eyes a little bit there. I'm, I'm getting that you don't love that suggestion. Tell me about that. Have you tried that in the past? Just having a discussion around the un- uncomfortable. Clients who are perpetually late, a lot of coaches goes, no worry, don't worry about it, and this continues on. No, let's have that conversation. Maybe this isn't a good time for us to meet. Is there a, another day that would be better for you? Or they kind of open up and share a big thing. Just say, wow, that was, that was a big thing you just shared. Let's just let's hold up a minute. I'm not going to skip over that. That's a big deal. Let's talk more about that. So I call it the rule of dialogue, I guess, if we're talking the rules of coaching. And I always just tell coach, give it oxygen. Things that you notice, just bring to the service in a, in a, very, in a very transparent, non-judgmental way. And clients kind of like that a little bit. Lawyers call it uh, taking the sting out of it. So what they'll do is they'll go up to the jury and they'll name every shitty thing about their case, all the bad things about their case. And by acknowledging that, it kind of takes away the pain because it takes it's more transparent. It's on the surface. Then they attack each one of those points. So same thing as us as coaches. Let's take the sting out of it. If there's something uncomfortable, an uncomfortable conversation that needs to be had, I would encourage coaches just to gently have that conversation. And it's like jumping into a cold pool, a little cold and frigid at first, and it's, it shocks your body. But after you're a better coach, the relationship is stronger. And honestly, it's like the, it gets rid of that just lingering thing, whatever that might be. So I'll call it the rule of dialogue. Give it oxygen, have the conversation, whatever it is, repeated struggle you're having with your clients. You know, I like that one because it has a hidden, it has a hidden benefit. And uh, those of you who are not coaches, but good friends, I think could heed this rule as well, because the hidden benefit is, is that, okay, this isn't like every other relationship, right? This relationship is an honest one. This is a relationship where uh, I'm actually going to be called to account and accepted, right? Uh, And an honest relationship. And the hidden benefit is, is that the people who aren't ready for real dialogue and real results and real coaching may, you may lose them in that regard. They may not be down for that kind of honest conversation, but the ones who are, you're going to know that they're kind of ready for results. And even friends, I always say honesty is kinder than kindness. And I think this is that idea of not letting those things go just to be kind or go along to get along, but actually say, Hey, Let's talk about that. So the hidden benefit is establishing the kind of relationship that is unique to coaching that they can't get anywhere else. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that, Ray, and then I'd love to hear your next one. Yeah, I would say that it's a requirement of good coaching. Like you cannot, you cannot let people skate over the difficult parts of their lives because that's where the gold lives, right? That's where you're going to find the gold and the diamonds and the, you know, all of the magic that happens in coaching is the reason people come to you as a coach is they're generally speaking, they feel stuck in their life. They feel stuck at least in a compartment of their life. If you're a business coach and they come to you, they feel stuck in their business. If you're a relationship coach, they feel stuck in their relationship and you, you know, you can't skate over the things that bring discomfort in the moment. And especially as a coach, uh, and I'd be interested to hear your your opinion on this because I've heard coaches say, you know, coaches don't deal with problems. Coaches don't. Coaches are not about pr- problems. Coaching is about you know helping people to play the game of life better. So, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's interesting. I would I would disagree with that. Actually, I, I think coaching is about problems, and specifically uh, the 
patterns uh, in people's lives, living life and these patterns that cause problems. So you can call it patterns or you can call it problems, but it's both the same uh, thing uh, to me. So, yeah, I would disagree with that. I think it is about problems. And I do think that problems are what people bring. Uh, that's why they come to coaching in the first place. So I'm surprised to hear that someone would say that, actually, because I think at least the perception is they have a problem. Otherwise, they wouldn't be sitting in front of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How would you guys define coaching? I mean, that's an interesting question. Love to hear your thoughts on that. Is this your second rule? What do you want to go first? How you define it? Um, I've heard a few different definitions. Um, you know, I, I gave you one of them, which was a, a coach is a professional best friend. And that, that kind of goes to my first point, which was that a coach is, is it, it's, it's a, it's, it's really a one directional relationship where you don't have to worry about reciprocation. You don't need to worry about judgment. You don't need to worry about any of that because that person is here just for you. And, and there's no other area in life where you get that. By the way, I just want to say that's the best definition I have ever heard for coach, a professional best friend. I absolutely love that. I was a bit surprised that you liked that one. I really do. Yeah. I think I am too, man. I think I'm yeah. surprised you like that one too. Yeah. I don't know why, but when you said that, I yeah. go, yeah, I am. Hey, me too. I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And I also think it's great for the, the best friends who are listening, right? Because I, the other thing I like about that is I go, truth of the matter is uh, everyone it should understand coaching. That's why I like this episode because whether you're a professional coach or not, you need to understand these tactics because they work if you want to help your friends. Maybe it, bo maybe it bothers me a little bit because best friend should mean, to me, it should mean like unconditional and coaching feels more transactional. Typically there's money involved. Mm -hmm. Typically there's a power dynamic. The coach is typically the one with the knowledge, the one with the expertise and guiding the sensei. Which one's the sensei? The mentor or the mentee? Uh, the, the, the mentor. Mentors, the mentor. Yeah, yeah, they're the sensei and you have your... The pad one. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Well, here, here's, here's why I think a uh, best friend, because the reason why is the best friend is the best friend because they are the person who will tell you the hard stuff, number one. And number two, they are the people who you will take the hard stuff from. Mm -hmm. And so I like professional best friend because that's what a coach does. They should help you point out the hard stuff. Now, what's different from a coach and a best friend is a coach isn't going to come out and just tell you they really want you. There is some sort of skill involved with letting the person find that. And uh, my next rule would essentially be that it's the law of questioning, right? Mm -hmm. It's that you have to be an amazing questioner and, uh, and primarily Socratic sort of questioning, open ended sort of questioning. And there's lots of ways to do this. One of the ones I know we all use, but the, mirroring to me is actually one of the most elegant ways to do questioning, right? Someone says something, we all, we all, of course, the three of us know this, but those of you listening may not know this is a very popular way. But if you're sitting there with your friend and they say, you know, I'm really frightened, you just essentially say you're frightened, right? And that opens the space and that's a, a form of questioning. And then it's basically like uh, other questions, like, have you uh, thought about why you're frightened? Have you thought about what you're going to do? And you essentially just ask and ask and ask. Because usually when someone is wanting coaching or advice, what they're really wanting to do is what they can't do by themselves, which is vent and get rebounds, right? Take shots and have thoughts and actually uh, vent and be able to have someone say, you know, here's what I, I think about that and just air it out. And so I think the law of questioning is next. And the Socratic part of that is essentially... Um, really questioning in a way to get them to question whether or not that story is true. Because people are telling themselves stories all the time that oftentimes are false narratives. And a coach who is a good questioner without saying, hey, do you really think that's true? Just by in the way they ask the question, get people to kind of go, oh, maybe that's not true. And so I think being an expert in question asking and the other, the final way I'd say you can ask questions is simply by silence. It's another way to ask a question. When someone says something and you say nothing, that's actually a question in a form, right? Because it's basically saying, okay, I guess I got to, what is it on me? You want me to say more? Yeah, I do. And sometimes a really good coach will even say something along the lines of, hey, you're not going to get away with that. There's a little bit more there. Tell me more, right? And so there's lots of different ways to ask these questions, 
Uh, and I would say that is a very important part of this. And I, I think a lot of, especially new coaches, get this wrong. And a lot of best friends don't realize they want to quickly give advice when the questioning actually gets the person to give their own advice oftentimes. And you don't even have to do the work because they solved it themselves, which is the best way to go. Yeah, there's uh talk about the silence thing, which I still struggle with. Silence too long, I'm like, all right, let's get it going. Let's <laughs> do something else. But there's uh the Japanese businessmen know that Americans do not like silence. So they'll sit there at the negotiation table and just Americans will be like, here's our first offer. And the Japanese say nothing. And the Americans cannot take it and they'll go, Okay, actually, here's a here's a second offer for a little less money. Or for a little more money. We'll give you more, we'll give you more. Okay, here's a third offer. Like the, the Japanese just sit there, and all of a sudden they have a three, their first offer is three times higher than it would have been otherwise. So it's interesting that silence is a really powerful tool if you can pull it off, which I have not been able to do yet. But I've been practicing that <laughs> actually consciously. That's a good. All of those are really good uh, techniques for questioning. I like that. Ray, did you have a second rule, man, or you just ha- you just posed a question? I'm I, recording well, them all, so we got to recap. I actually think Ray's uh, second question was a really powerful one because it's basically like, hey, one of the most important rules of coaching is know what the hell a coach is. So it's funny mm-hmm. how Ray always does that, right? He's always yeah. he's always subtle in the way he approaches it. Like if you need to know what a good a good coach is, and so I really like that. That was like that pop probably could be the like first rule it. of all of this. Your your second rule, like it's this idea. Did like you, you better did, know did, what a coach actually is. Did you have a definition of coach that you really like? Uh, you know, yes, I do. And to me, a coach is a pattern spotter. That's the best way. He they are an expert at spotting patterns that get people stuck. They're expert at that. And call it stories. An expert at you know spotting the stories. But I would say that uh, my definition of a coach is to spot the patterns that cause the problems. That's ultimately what an expert coach is. The best coach is spot the patterns that cause the problems. I once heard uh, the definition of a coach. I don't know if it's a definition of a coach, but a coach, a coach basically, a great coach basically says, I have high standards for you. I know that you can reach them. In case you don't, I will be here to support you. That's kind of, I really like that. So it's like high standards, like, yeah, push them a little bit. That's your job as a coach. Give, give them that belief that they can hit those. And even if they don't, be the supportive person who has their back that it's it's okay. This is all part of the process to coach them through that. And I, I've always really liked that definition. Yeah. Another definition I heard was from a professional football coach who said, a coach is somebody who makes you do what you don't want to do so you can be who you want to be. That's good too. Yeah. Yeah. And And, and the truth is, the real definition of coach probably is going to be a culmination of all of these things together in small, some pieces of this some pieces of that. But in essence, what would you, what would you say is the essence of coaching? Like essentially it's you and I are going to talk and this is what makes it a hard sell for a lot of people. You and I are going to talk and your life is going to change. I mean, that's essentially what coaching is. And without the change, without the transformation, um, is it still coaching? We'll be back after a quick break. Okay, jumping in real quick because I have something that I am crazy excited about that's been something in the works for a while now, and this is the Dr. Jade chatbot. You might say, what is that? (laughs) Well, you all know ChatGPT, you probably know Bard AI and all the AI models, these large language models that are trained on the entire internet that you can now go to and say, hey, write me a program or, hey, uh, give me some advice on this or, hey, give me, uh, you know, some issues around uh, getting over breakups or dealing with hard things in my life. Well, essentially, I have had a team over the last several months take all of my information, tens of thousands of data points from all of my programs going all the way back 20 years ago to all of my books to all of my blog posts and social media posts to all of my podcast. All of this information has been plugged in to a large language model that is trained on my material so that when you use the Dr. Jade chatbot, you can say, hey, Jade, what do I do for menopause? Hey, Jade, what do I do when I'm going through a breakup? Hey, Jade, can you write me a 12-week program complete with diet? And it's going to be trained on my material in the ways that I do things, as it pertains to fat loss, as it pertains to muscle gain, as it pertains to 
uh, personal development, as it pertains to career and finance, as it pertains to personal relationships, right? All of these kinds of things, purpose and meaning, all the next level human material, all the Dr. Jade material, everything in the genres of mindset, muscle, and metabolism that you get on this podcast are in this chat bot. And you get to carry it around with you wherever you go. And one of the things I'm committed to doing with the Next Level Human business is allowing you to pay what you want for these services. Some people can pay more because you have the resources. Some people don't and they pay less. So you can pay as little as $2 per month for this chat bot. Of course, if you can pay more, please pay more because then you're being the Next Level Human who allows people to pay much less. But for as little as $2, Per month, you get to essentially have me in your pocket as your personal health coach and metabolism assistant. If you're interested in getting the chat bot, all you have to do is go to drjade.com slash chat, drjade.com slash chat, and you can get the Dr. Jade Tita chat bot and begin working with me in your pocket every single day for as little as $2 a month. I hope you will check it out. Let me know how you do with it. And let's get back to the show. hundred percent. Yes. Uh, from my perspective, yes, I, I actually think that, uh, and it goes to, um, uh, sort of Danny's first role, right. Uh, of this person who didn't necessarily have the skill set and, You'll even see this a lot. And all of us coaches know this. You, the three of us have talked about that this weekend, that oftentimes you don't get results, right? So the idea that a good coach always gets results, I don't know that that's the case. A good coach always relates. A good coach is always there for you. A good coach is, is in the humanness and the mess with you. And people will stay with that coach forever, even if they don't get results. And so that tells you something about that. Now we can argue about, well, if you're not getting results and they're paying you, and I get that argument, but I would say that uh, you know, the best coaches sometimes don't. That's why I, again, go back to your definition, the professional best friend. Sometimes uh, the best result is that someone feels human and heard and understood because they can get that nowhere else in their life. And that has nothing to do with an exchange of like culturally successful. And that's the other thing I'll just throw out here. I think that one of the biggest mistakes, as you guys know, this is my high horse, but one of the biggest mistakes we make is to judge our, all of our lives through success in these very, very narrow domains. You know, like if you're not successful in relationships, then you're horrible and you're not a good person. If you don't have money and done something of value in the corporate world, then you're no good. If you don't have a six pack and you're not lean, then you're no good. And I just reject all of that. Uh, so I think a good coach shows up for people to be human and messy. And that's the most valuable thing you can possibly do. So I don't know if you guys agree with that, but I really, I'm really adamant about that. Hmm. I see. I don't, I don't agree with it. Yeah. I think in order for it to be a coaching relationship and there needs to be some progress yeah. in the person's life, there needs to be some transformation. Yeah. Otherwise it's just a nice conversation. And, uh, and yeah, and, and it's fine if that's, if that's what you want to do with clients is just have nice conversations and have them feeling nice in the end, feeling good in the end. But really people, people, you know, I don't think anybody has ever woke up and said, you know what? I have to have a coach without a coach. I'm, you know, I, I can't, I can't survive. Like it's. It, really, this is the progression aspect of life. I, I want to progress. So therefore I find a coach. So I don't know. I, I, I would, I would disagree and say that, that in my definition of a coach transformation, or if you want to take it one notch down progress in your life is an essential component of the coaching definition. Danny, your thoughts. Um, this might be an, a poor metaphor, but I'm just like, but if a basketball coach coaches all season and never wins a game and the kids that he's coaching don't improve or progress really all season, he's still coaching. He may not be a great coach, but he's still coaching. If that's what we're talking about. I do think I kind of lean towards Jay. Like if you're, if you're showing up, you're bringing the, you're doing your part 
asking the tough questions when necessary, building them up when necessary. If you're doing your part, I say, yeah, you're you're in the act of coaching. Now, how good you are, that can vary. Client, I've, I've done this kind of in, informal survey probably for the past five years. Just like how, how good – actually, you were the one, Jade. I asked you a long time ago, like a decade ago, and, and I brought this up last time I was on your pod too. You told me. I was like, how many – how often do you have success in the clinic? This is when you're working with patients and you're seeing them three times a week. I was like, what's your success rate? And I know last time you said, I don't know if that's true or not, but you guessed at the time it was around 30 to 40%. Mm-hmm. And I've been conducting this sort of informal survey when I was in the gym, personal training. I asked those guys. I've been obviously in the past three years, I've been just observing coaches and the data. And what I have found is on average, the best coaches, the best coaches succeed about 40% of the time. So I think there needs to be a little bit of grace and just like, yo, this shit is hard. The job of a coach is really, really hard. So I just think, not that we should just resign, that it's impossible, but I do think getting a, a, a realistic gauge of how hard this is and how realistic it is to get results is a good starting point. And if you're going there like, yeah, I probably succeed 30% of the time, then yeah, let's see how we can get that to 35% of the time. Let's see how we can improve your skills to get it to 40% of the time. But even the best clinicians, best coaches seemingly fail. It's like we're pl- we're closer to baseball than Amazon fulfillment. Mm. Like a Hall of Fame baseball player hits 300. Yeah. Amazon fulfillment is at 99% delivery on time or whatever, right? So we're I think sometimes coaches lean like I got to be Amazon fulfillment and deliver every single time. Otherwise, I'm a shitty coach or I'm not doing it right. When in reality, you're a Hall of Famer if you're succeeding 40% of the time. Yeah, actually. And you know what? I, I really – this is why I love these conversations with you guys because – um you know, I think I, you know, I think after hearing both of your arguments, I, I, I think uh, I like both in a sense, and I like mine too. But here's how I look: <laughs> if we go, if we go to your, your basketball analogy, which you're right is an imperfect analogy for this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Ray, Ray makes a great point. Like a, a, a basketball coach, if he's being measured on basketball, who doesn't win is going to get fired, right? Like he's, he's not going to, so he's not going to be a coach long. So I'm totally with Ray on that. On the other hand, I go a basketball coach who is working on the development of his players. And that's more what he's about, right? He's more about win or lose. I want to win, but I would rather prepare you to win because you're not going to be, you know, a basketball player forever. You know, I want to make good people in the world, right? Then that person in my mind wins. And so I do think it's partly where we're, we're coming from in that regard, right? And, and also this brings another point about being, I think, a rule of coaching that just sort of came out of this discussion, which is to say that uh, know the domains and know who you're dealing with. You know, if you're dealing with someone, I don't know, if you're dealing with an Austrian or a German or someone who's very much like, at least it's my perception, like I'm paying you money, you better get me results, then I think you're going to have to lean a little bit more to where Ray's at. You know, you're going to have to you know, really define what that is. Uh, but if you're dealing with someone who's a little bit like, look, I'm just here because I'm struggling a little bit in life. I'm not exactly clear on what's going on and um, my purpose is sort of vague and things like that, then the d- definition of success moves away from making more money, getting fit or finding a relationship and more moves to how do you feel about who you are in the world? Uh, and this is what uh, we were talking about before, where it's just like not everything gets to be and should be, in my opinion, measured through those three metrics. To me, the most important thing and the thing that you're going to feel most fulfilled with at the end of your life is purpose and meaning the experience you brought, the energy you brought, the example you set, right? And I think that, um, so yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I depend, maybe, maybe one of the rules we could say about a really good coaches is, is to know, right? Like to know the kind of person you're dealing with, like, you know, the law of individuality, that's another, another rule. So yeah, this is why these discussions are so important and it's really good for uh, all of us coaches to get in the room and have these discussions. Well, my last rule on it, one more round. Keep on going. One right, more my, la- my last rule is this is important, and most people start here and they kind of end here, but it is important. I would say it's like the rule of competence. Like you do have to actually be good, and you have to know your stuff at some point. Even the woman I shared at the beginning who's a super connector, she was also very growth-oriented, and she dove into the education. She took feedback really well, and she got better at – the area that she wasn't great in at first, which is the knowledgeability around the metabolism, around hormones, stuff that we were delivering. So I do think 
you do have to have some skills. Like you do have to know your stuff at least to a degree. And this other stuff is also important. I think a lot of coaches come in, they get the certifications, they start at competence, which is great. Uh, but then they miss some of these other things we're talking about. But I do think competence, knowledge, expertise is, is still very important. I don't think it can be overlooked. That'd be my final rule. I'm practicing silence. <laughs> Ray's practicing <laughs> silence. <laughs> You know, I've, I've given you this rule. I gave it on your podcast, but I'll give it again here because I think it is important. I agree. And that is that uh, that um, if you want to – this is actually the fastest way to elevate how good of a coach you are. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost an instantaneous way to elevate how good of a coach you are, and that is choose better clients. Because as you know – and this kind of goes back to what you were talking about when we were um, pseudo-arguing about – the need for transformation and, and progress and results in people's lives. And that is um, that uh, um, that not everybody's coachable, right? So you could be the best coach in the world. And if you pick the wrong client, an uncoachable client, they're not going to progress. They're not going to see results. They're certainly not going to see transformation. So, and, and one of the problems I think a lot of, especially new coaches run into is they're in this, uh, this, this uh, famine mindset where, uh, I saw. I once saw an episode of of Doctor Phil where this this millionaire woman was um, talking about how she was going on these sites where to date where uh, they were looking for sh- for um, sugar mommies, right? And so so he says he says to her he says so basically what you're telling me is that the only the only requirement you have is that they own a keyboard. <laughs> and, and a lot of coaches go that same route. They, they basically will ch- take anybody who will just say yes to my coaching offer. And so, the, so I say, you know, if you want to become an instantly better coach, choose better clients. Choose people who are going to uh, do the work. Choose people who are ready for coaching. Not everybody is ready for coaching. And, 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 and be... Be, be confident in saying, look, you know, I don't know that coaching is right for you right now. And, and try to help them. Try to say, here's what I would suggest that you do right now. You know, with a, if you're a business coach, for example, it's very easy to do this. You know, it's very easy to come, to come across somebody who's not ready for a business coach. Not everybody's ready for a business coach. What you need to do is you need to go set up, you know, figure out what it is that you want to do. You need to go set up your website. And then, you know, you need to do this, get your first client and then come to me and we'll, 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 we'll take it to the sky, you know, from there. Uh, the second thing I'll say is, is if, if, if either you don't agree with me and, and, and you don't believe that you need to choose better clients, then at the very least, you need to at least create better clients and you need to teach people how to be coachable. You need to teach people how to take full advantage of this coaching process because I believe, I honestly believe coaching can be one of the most transformative forces on earth right now, especially in today's day and age. Mm -hmm. As AI is moving in, jobs are going to start moving out. And as jobs start to move out, people's purposes are going to start to shift and change. Uh, You're going to find a lot of people who found found, uh, their vocation as their purpose. Those vocations disappear almost overnight. And people are going to be looking for a new, for purpose. They're going to be looking for meaning. They're going to be looking for new careers. And I think coaching is positioned to be one of the greatest forces of you know of the next decade when it's done right. You know when it's done right. So you have to you have to a pick the right people if you can't if uh, if you can't do that or if you've got somebody who you think might be right but you're not sure create a great client. Teach them how to be coached. You know. I wholeheartedly agree. I, I just jump in real quick, Jay, to say, because Ray and I have gone back and forth <laughs> on this a lot about like, all right, well, what if I can't coach LeBron James? Then what? Then I just can't be a great coach. I tease him in that uh, by being hyperbolic. But <laughs> I love the second part because I do think you have a lot of control to teach people how to be coachable. And I, I told Ray this this morning when we see all these people come through the, our old program, Jay, and – I basically had this, started to have this pattern recognition. I could tell within the first 10 to 15 minutes of their very first call, if they were going to get results or not. So now we had our coaches go and be like, you know what the difference is between someone who gets results and doesn't? It's 
being coachable. Let me tell you what that means. It means it's a collaboration. You're you're just as involved as I am. This is your life. This is your show. I'm here to guide you, support you. But we got to do we got to do this as a partnership. You have to kind of buy. You have to buy into this. And if you're not ready, that's all good. That's okay. Doing things like that, talking expectations. What do you expect to get out of this program? You, what are your What do the results look like to you in a 12 week program? And a lot of times, clients will be like, you probably lose like I don't know 75 pounds. And that gives you the opportunity as a coach to be like, all right, let's talk about that a little bit. If you lost 75 pounds, I would have a panic attack in 12 weeks. Like, that's not a good thing, right? We want to make sure it's sustainable, healthy weight loss. But I love the addendum, man. I'm on board now. Teach them to be coachable. And I think we have a lot more power as coaches to do that than maybe we think. Uh, not everybody even still, I have to say, not everybody is coachable, at, at least not at this time in their life. you know. And, and I, I had a client like this once. And... Uh, and I, I knew on day one that he was not going to, he and I were not going to vibe. So sometimes it's, they're not coachable by you. Yeah. They may be coachable by somebody else, but, um, but I just knew and I tried, I, I really tried. I mean, I really tried to say, right, maybe you're just, maybe, maybe you're just, maybe you're just wrong. Maybe, maybe he is coachable and he'll come around, but, um, it didn't do him any good. It didn't do me any good to keep him keep to keep it going. And eventually, you know, we did part ways. But uh but um I think it's especially for new and newer coaches, I feel like you should be really picky. Picky you should be more picky in the beginning than you are than you are when you're a seasoned coach, because when you're a seasoned coach, you can do things like that. Like it's easier for you to know how to take somebody who's not coachable or or uh has difficulty with the coaching process and and get them warm, you know, warm them up into the coaching process. But as a new coach, you know, you need, you need to be, I think a little bit more picky and, and that's hard when you, when you're trying to make money as a coach and you, you have nothing coming in. You know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, Jamie? no, I, lo- I love those. I feel like, uh, I feel like we covered a lot of good ground and I don't necessarily want to muddy the water with, uh, <laughs> with anything else. You know, I think it's this, these are really Really amazing uh, roles, and I really kind of want to uh, shut it down right there. Um, you want me to do a recap of the rules? Yeah. So yeah, we just, do them. Just so you can hear them back, man. Yeah. See if we stand by these. Otherwise, we'll have to yeah, scratch yeah, yeah. this podcast for sure. <laughs> All right. We have the rule of connection. Ray, I'm calling your first one basically the rule of presence, like being there and responsive. Jay, the law of humanity and empathy, the law of dialogue, the law of questioning, the law of competence. I'm calling it the law of know your role. Know what a definition of a coach is, that one. The law of individuality. And the closer, the law of get good clients. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. So uh, thanks so much for hanging out with us on the show. Real quick, uh, Danny, uh, tell everyone where they can find you. Danny has his own podcast. Definitely go and check him out. Where where can everyone get more of you, Danny? And, and tell them about your coaching academy. Uh, those of you who want uh, expert instruction on coaching from Danny. He has a coaching academy that is just excellent. So tell them where they can get more of you. Yeah, man. I uh, take care radio and it's at take care radio podcast on Instagram, which we just decided this week and I'm going to delete Instagram. So I don't know how useful that is, but take care radio is <laughs> the pod where I do, uh, where I do put out a new episode every single week. And uh, you can also join my newsletter at, at takecarecoaching.com. And I also, the Coaching Academy, thanks for shouting that out, Jade. Brand new coaching program. I essentially call it a, a psychology of coaching program. If you have, you already have the competence elements, you understand the law of thermodynamics and the three planes of motion. You got your ACE certification. That's awesome. But there's a whole nother skill set to actually build relationships with clients, to communicate in effective ways, to build confidence and conviction as a coach. And that's the kind of thing we talk about in the Coaching Academy, which you can uh, check out at TakeCareCoaching.com as well. Nice. Ray, how do people get, get you? I would just go to the uh, Find the Podcast 5-Minute Coaching School, and, uh, and it's really just a series of very, very short uh, one- to five-minute episodes where we just kind of go through and upgrade our coaching skills one little bit at a time. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this with two of my best friends on the planet. Uh, Thanks so much for hanging out and we'll see you at the next show. You have been listening to the Next Level Human podcast with Dr. Jade Tita. If you enjoyed this episode... 
please make sure you subscribe and consider leaving a review. You make the biggest difference when you pass on your lessons and inspire others. That's why reviews like this are so powerful. Your words may be the only ones that resonate for someone else. Please remember the information in this podcast is for educational purposes only. Always consult your personal physician or therapist before making any lifestyle changes. And finally, thank you for who you are in the world and the difference you make.